Okay, please welcome our second speaker, John Roman, who will be telling us about synesthetic color. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, so I've been thinking about synesthetic color for a while in different kinds of ways, and only uh, recently philosophically. The question, uh, what is synesthetic color? I think uh, easy and maybe un uninteresting answer to that question, which is that um, Synesthetic color is the color involved in cases of color synesthesia, um, a neurological condition in which color experiences are produced by something other than visible light. Um, but my interest in writing this paper has uh, more to do with what the main theories in color ontology would say about synesthetic color, how would, how would, how would they treat synesthetic color, um, would they recognize synesthetic color as real, if, if, if not, why not, um, and if so, how would they ascribe uh, synesthetic uh, colors properties to, to objects, um, and would they be able to distinguish synesthetic color from normal colors? And how would they do that? So these are the kinds of um, questions I, I'm interested in. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, three lines of thinking broadly, uh, realism, uh, external realism in particular, um, the view that color is a, a property of objects and therefore real, uh, anti-realism, that color isn't a property of objects and therefore not real. And then adverbialism, uh, a certain formulation that's been given by uh, Mishrita Sharamuda recently, um, that color is a property of interactions. So in regard to those questions I was talking about earlier, uh, which theory can affirm the reality of synesthetic color and which can distinguish synesthetic color from normal color, um, and avoid the excess of ascribing these color properties to all of the kinds of things that induce uh, synesthetic color because synesthetic color by definition is something is color experience induced by something other than the things that normally induce color experience. Um, so I find that the verbalism, the, the view that color is a property of interactions, can do all three of these things um, if we want all three of these things. Um, so whether this is a new direction or a dead end, I suppose we'll, we'll find out shortly. Uh, so first, let me. Let me just talk about what synesthesia is. So synesthesia is a, a kind of a broad and general definition is a neurological condition in which the stimulation of one sensory modality or cognitive pathway um, leads to involuntary experiences in a second modality or, or cognitive pathway. And the original stimulus uh, is known as the inducer uh, and the, the secondary experience is known as the concurrent. So, uh, cases of color synesthesia and cases of synesthesia in which the concurrent is color. Uh, so, for example, uh, in a case of sound color synesthesia, uh, the stimulus would be sound and then that would be accompanied by a certain experience of color. So, for example, um, hearing the sound of a church organ and an experience of greenness. Uh, and, and, and there are variations in the, the things, the types of inducers for synesthetic color. There's graphene uh, color synesthesia. Uh, there's, I think, smell color synesthesia, taste color synesthesia. And the inducer concurrent associations uh, vary. So for some, uh, the sound of a church organ might be associated with an experience of greenness, uh, and for others, it might be associated with an experience of, uh, of redness, for example. Um, and broadly speaking, there are two kinds of synesthetic color experience. Uh, the projective kind, in which people report color being projected into their visual field. Um, this is something that's been tested with after image and, and pop out tests. And then associative synesthesia, um, which Fiona McPherson describes as colors being in the mind's eye or the head. And to be a, a genuine case of this kind of associative synesthesia, um, these colors need to be involuntary. Uh, vivid and uh, reliably associated. So, um, I guess there's some difficulty in understanding how we should classify synesthetic color. Um, are they hallucinatory, illusory, or like normal colors? And each case seems to be a, a bit of an awkward fit. Um, unlike hallucinatory colors, they do involve an interaction with external stimuli. Uh, unlike normal colors, uh, the stimuli that's 
part of this interaction is not the kind of thing that's involved in normal color. Uh, and then unlike illusory colors, they don't inhibit or obscure our interactions with the external world. They seem to do the opposite. Um, so I think, I think that essentially the problem of synesthesia consists in this tension between its abnormality but also its, its usefulness. Um, these colors are idiosyncratic and unrelated to the things normal colors relate to, uh, and yet they prove to be useful in basic perceptual uh, and complex cognitive tasks. So uh, I think perhaps the most promising strategy uh, for deflating the problem of synesthetic color is to treat synesthetic colors as illusory. Um, Richard Gray and Torn Alter take this route. Uh, Adam Wager and Greg Rosenberg uh, disagree. Um, so I, 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 have, I have trouble uh, buying some of the arguments for why synesthetic color is illusory, or at least any more convincing. Um, if synesthetic color is illusory, I think one of these two claims have, have to be true. Um, that synesthetic color is, is maladaptive, that it interferes with uh, the perceiver's environmental interactions in some way, or that only normal colors can represent external stimuli. That these synesthetic colors, by definition, are essentially non veridical. Um, in regard to the first claim, it seems the consensus among synesthesia researchers is that synesthesia uh, is more likely to enhance rather than inhibit. Um, person performance in basic perceptual and cognitive and more complex cognitive tasks. Synesthesis group have superior memory, um, greater than average intelligence and excel at uh, certain uh, complex tasks like metaphor making and artistic creation. And then in regard to the second claim, um, beyond preserving a, a prior commitment to externalist representationalism, I, I, I don't find a compelling reason why only non-synesthetic experience uh, can relate to representational content. Um, so representationalism is, as Horn Alter defines it, the view that phenomenal properties uh, are representational properties. And so um, color synesthesia poses a threat to the uh, externalist representationalist uh, because it allows for the possibility that two uh, mental states, one synesthetic and, and one not, can be alike in representational content, uh, but different in phenomenal character. And so, therefore, the externalist claims that synesthetic colors are misrepresentations uh, to ensure that the representational content cannot yield different phenomenal properties. So, uh, in their view, both uh, both Alter and Gray, synesthetic colors misrepresent uh, the same things that normal colors represent. But since, by definition, synesthetic colors are not caused by the same things as normal colors, uh, synesthetic colors can only misrepresent. Um, but I think this treatment overstates the relationship between the representational content and phenomenal character. Uh, for the sound color synesthete, both oral and uh, chromatic and, and color experience, uh, both, both the oral and uh, color character of, of their experience seem to relate uh, to the representation of, of sound. And in fact, uh, for, for some synesthetes, the concurrent experience uh, is not something extra, but an inseparable part uh, of experiencing the inducer, in this case, sound. So one uh, sound shape, uh, since he describes his hearing as follows, he says the sounds are not distinct from hearing, uh, the shapes are not distinct from hearing uh, sounds, they are part of what hearing is, that's just what sound is, it couldn't possibly be anything else. And so of course the oral experience uh, of sound is normal, while the chromatic experience of sound is abnormal, um, but I don't think it follows that only the former can represent sound. And considering in genuine cases of sound color synesthesia, uh, synesthetic color is as involuntary and reliable uh, as oral experience is for non-synesthetes, uh, the choice to reduce synesthetic color to the same status as, as uh, illusion uh, seems weakly supported. So if we are to privilege uh, normal phenomenal properties over the synesthetic phenomenal properties. I think our reasons need to be more than an appeal to the non-synesthetic majority. Um, and so, since I don't find those reasons, I, I'm opting to treat, uh, to put both synesthetic color and normal color on the same um, oncological footing. So, in color ontology, uh, I mean, there are two basic lines of, uh, of thinking, realism and anti-realism. Um, and in realism, the, the 
the view is that uh, colors are properties of objects, and, and I'm only cons uh, considering externalist realism here, so um, physicalism, dispositionalism, primitivism. Um, and the other view, anti-realism, that colors are not properties of objects, and therefore <coughs> colors aren't real. And so in, in, in the case of uh, the realist, uh, some philosophers choose uh, to try to determine which properties these are of objects that they can identify with color, and that this seems to be a difficult task. Uh, some choose reflectance, that's the, the amount of light uh, an object reflects. Others choose productance, the kind of light that, uh, come, the light that comes from an object. Uh, Bern and Hilbert take that, take that uh, strategy. But according to these views, the reality of color depends on whether color can be located in, in the external world. Uh, if color is a property of objects, it's real. Uh, if not, it's not real. This is what Frank Jackson calls the location problem with color. Um, he says, colors must, if they are instantiated anywhere, be findable somehow. And so this location approach to color ontology is, is, is present in both realism and anti-realism. Um, it's present in Barry Mound's anti-realism claim that colors are virtual and that although I locate them in space, they're not actually there. Um, and also in Brian McLaughlin's uh, realism when he claims that it's the, vision, it's the job of vision science, science to identify the physical property in question and thereby to locate the property of redness in nature. And so this approach may seem unproblematic for, for normal color, but when it applied to synesthetic color, some, some difficulties arise. So if synesthetic color um, is real, uh, it must be a property of objects. However, given the diversity of stimuli uh, that induce synesthetic experience, and the idiosyncratic nature of, of uh, these synesthetic uh, color associations, the description of these color properties to objects would result in an extreme ontological excess. And while the, the realist might, might argue that normal color can be restricted to some, some, physical, some objective properties, say reflectance, um, there's no such restriction available in the case of synesthetic color, since by definition, synesthetic color is color experience induced by something other than what induces uh, normal color. So in effect, there could be as many such properties in the world as there are inducer and, and concurrent associations. On the other hand, if, if synesthetic color is not real, we have two options, one anti-realist and one realist. Uh, the anti-realist option is to claim that synesthetic color, like all colors, is not real. And on the one hand, this gives synesthetic color the same um, ontological status as normal color. On the other hand, it's difficult to to say how we would distinguish uh, uh, synesthetic color from normal color. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the realist option is to claim that synesthetic colors are not real because um, they're not properties of objects. And, and on the one hand, this does distinguish synesthetic color from normal color. Um, but on the other hand, it treats synesthetic colors as ontologically different, a stance which um, I'm skeptical about. Uh, in a longer version of this paper, I also address Cohen's role functionalism and Mattin's uh, sensory, uh, sensory classificationism. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, so I think if we take this location approach to color, um, accommodating synesthetic color uh, seems difficult if not impossible. Not all theories take this route. Uh, Ms. Vita Shiramuda proposes an adverbial theory uh, which avoids the, this problem of, of location. Uh, so instead of restricting color to objective properties, Sherwood defines colors as property of interactions between perceivers and stimuli. Uh, so against the location approach, she argues that there is um, no color in the object on the one hand and color in the mind on the other. There's just one color, uh, the property of a perceptual process. Uh, and by process here, she means a, a perceiving event. Um, and by property, she has something in mind like an adverb. So just to be clear, um, an event is um, an event is some unit of space time, something uh, that, that has a spatial location and a certain temporal duration. And an adverb is something that describes an event. So a clapping of hands is an event. Um,
Um, and so because Shermuda conceives of, of colors as properties of events, events or, or standards for reality differ from those who consider colors to be properties of objects. Um, in her view, the reality of color doesn't depend on whether they are properties of objects, uh, but whether they're useful to the perceiver. Uh, so she adopts a form of pragmatism with regard to perception, uh, in which correspondence is, is replaced by usefulness. Uh, so when asked, what does it take for a perceptual state to be right, um, in, in her pragmatism she responds that it must work, it has to give a useful guide to the surrounding environment, um, and when asked, what are perceptual states for, uh, her response is to help you live by guiding your activity in the world. Um, in, in, in contrast to the, to the correspondence answer, which would be um, to the first question, what does it take for a perceptual state to be right, um, that the external world must correspond to the perceptual state um, that it represents, and what are perceptual states for to detect um, what is in the external world. So, um, in Shiramuna's view, colors are adverbs of perceiving events, uh, and colors' reality depends on its usefulness, not on its place in the external world. And so this is the definition she gives uh, of color. Colors are properties of perceptual interactions involving the perceiver, endowed with a spectrally discriminated visual system, and a stimulus with spectral contrast of the sort that can be exploited by this visual system. So uh, by perceiver, she means any sighted animal with the right kind of visual system, and by right kind of visual system, she means the, the visual machinery of, of all creatures conventionally classified as having color vision proper. Um, so, she doesn't uh, want to include things like, uh, like for example, a, a worm that responds to the light stimuli doesn't qualify as having color on her view. Um, the visual system has to involve upon the processing or some degree of color constancy. And by stimulus, she means um, an excitation that bears spectral contrast, which is that it reflects or generates patterns of light. Uh, that can that are within the discriminable discriminable range of the of the perceiver's visual system, uh, and so I think there are some useful parts to take of Shermuda's approach for dealing with synesthetic color. Uh, if we want to give synesthetic color um, uh, a, a fuller treatment than treating it as as illusion, um, although we couldn't recognize synesthetic color as color on on the definition as, it, as it's proposed. So um, I, I offer the, the follow uh, trio of definitions. Um, and so the definition that she gives of color, I, I think, is, is, is the right one to give for, for normal color. Um, and the, the definition we could offer for synesthetic color goes something like this. That synesthetic colors are properties of perceptual interactions involving a perceiver with a synesthetic sensory system and a stimulus that does not involve spectral contrast, but that the system can exploit to produce experience that is qualitatively similar to normal color. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, colors in general are properties of interactions involving a perceiver with a color perceiving sensory system and a stimulus that induces color experience. So um, I, I don't know how to remove color from the, the second part from the uh, right hand of the right hand side of that definition. Um, I think colors are just colors, and I, I, don't, I don't know if there's much more we can say about that, but we can, um, I guess, investigate the things that, that uh, are often part of uh, interactions that give rise to color. Uh, so, in its rejection of the location approach uh, and its inclusion of color experiences not induced by the spectral contrast stimuli, uh, I find Invertil is better equipped to deal with synesthetic color. So by adopting that, that trio of definitions, I think we can do these three things that I, that I set, out, uh, set out to do at the beginning of the talk. And the first is that we can affirm the reality of synesthetic color um, by, by first putting synesthetic color and normal color on the same ontological footing as properties of interactions, and also by acknowledging the usefulness of synesthetic color instead of treating uh, color as being a property uh, of objects. And then secondly, we can distinguish synesthetic color from normal color with reference to the, the kind of stimulus involved um, in these kinds of interactions. 
And third, we can avoid the excess of, of uh, uh, the ontological excess of ascribing these properties to everything that induces synesthetic color um, by limiting these descriptions just to the interactions when they occur between um, the, the stimuli in question and the receivers. Um, so, of course, you know, uh, many problems remain for adverbialism, and it's not my intent to defend uh, all of those problems. Uh, some, some of them I have no answer to. I don't have an answer to Frank Jackson's many <laughs> problem. Um, but I do want to argue that much of what we consider to be distinctly, um, to be distinct weaknesses of adverbialism um, may be distinctly advantageous uh, for dealing with synesthetic color. So in particular, in particular, I'll look at criticisms regarding procedure dependence, um, predication, phenomenology. Um, Jonathan Cohen raises these objections, among others, in his review um, of Shermuda's book, and so I'll respond to each of them in turn. Uh, first, the, the problem of procedure dependence. Since colors are properties of interaction between perceivers and, and stimuli, they're necessarily perceiver dependent, um, and colors are present only where um, the stimuli of the right kind, the receivers of the right kind, are, are interacting. So therefore, in the absence of, of perceivers, there, there aren't colors. Um, so Cohen raises the objection that this is uh, counterintuitive and idealistic to suppose that colors go in and out of existence with events uh, when perceivers die or close their eyes or shift attention. Um, but I think this rapid creation and termination of, of colors is, is inoffensive. Um, Shermud is, is not arguing that uh, physical properties like reflectance go in and out of existence. Um, she's just denying that colors uh, exist apart from these, from these interactions. So, um, and she denies that, the, that we should identify color with any one component of, of such interactions. So, in her view, reflectance exists, perceivers exist, illuminance exists. Uh, when they interact, normal color exists as well. Um, and when they don't, the color ceases to exist. And so a theory that claims colors are perceiver uh, independent, in, uh, perceiver independent uh, implicitly deny the reality of synesthetic colors. Um, so synesthetic colors are ephemeral and, and highly idiosyncratic. Um, they do go in and out of existence as the synesthete shifts attention, and in the inducer color associations vary widely across individual cases of synesthesia. So, for example, um, uh, Blake and his colleagues in 2005 give this example of these two sets of graphemes, and they're given to, the, to these uh, 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 grapheme color synesthetes. Uh, so the grapheme, in, in either case, in both sets, is, is the same. Um, in the first set, um, uh, presented beside A and C, uh, it induces an experience of, of the B color, all that red or something. And then in the second set, um, it induces an experience of the 13 color. We can call it something like uh, orange, I suppose. Uh, and they also found that when the synesthete shifted attention between these, these two sets, uh, they had a different experience. In the one case, uh, they could switch between the, the, the 13, um, 13 color orange and the B color uh, red. So if synesthetic colors are perceiver-dependent properties, uh, this example really poses uh, no threat. The two synesthetic colors associated with this, with this graphene go in, and out, go in and out of existence depending on how the perceiver tends um, to them. And so there's no uh, one synesthetic color property ascribed to, to, uh, to, to this graphene. Um, However, we do encounter some difficulty explaining um, explaining this example if color, if synesthetic color properties are perceiver independent. Um, and so, in order to maintain the reality of of, uh, of synesthetic color, we have to either ascribe um, contradictory properties to the same thing. So this would bear uh, red and orange at the same time, or we could choose one to the exclusion of the other, uh, the red color or or, or the orange color. Um, and I don't think each, each case makes, uh, makes much sense. Uh, the first one would be contradictory, and the second one seems arbitrary. And, and Cohen also criticizes um, 
Chairman is account for conflicting with the usual view that color qualifies individuals rather than events, uh, a tradition which is supported by um, grammatical structure of color predications in almost every natural language. Um, to this, uh, well, there, there are two responses to this, one which involves a bit of uh, uh, shoulder shrugging and, and another <coughs> um, defensive view which um, uh, which uh, which in a slight color could 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 help us uh, could, could could help us defend. So um, I mean, Sher Shermood is clear uh, in saying that she's not giving account for how we talk, nor is she suggesting uh, how we should talk. So the suggestion that saying uh, a sentence instead of I see red, changing it to I see redly, is not a suggestion for. Uh, prescriptive in the sense of how we should talk of when we proceed. And she's not saying that uh, um, that, that, uh, uh, that, that this is how we how, how we do talk already. Um, in fact, it'd be remarkable if our ordinary way of, of predicating could could predict some of the latest developments in, in color science. And I'm not sure whether this reconciliation between language and the, the nature of color are Entirely possible, um, but where adverbialism appears inadequate in accounting for uh, natural language predication, natural language predication seems inadequate for accounting for synesthetic color experience. So, in ordinary language, only certain combinations of sensing verbs and uh, and sensory properties make sense. For example, I I hear red is awkward and, and it's difficult to understand, and similarly. Um, I see red in my mind's eye when I hear a certain kind of sound um, is maybe more grammatical but hardly less cryptic um, and I think more misleading that it is informative of synesthetic experience. Um, and as it, testimony from one sound colored synesthete um, describing his experience, he says it's definitely, it's definitely colors but I'm not sure that seeing is the most accurate description. I am seeing but not with my eyes if that makes sense. Um, Adverbialism, on the other hand, can accommodate synesthetic statements um, with less strength. Uh, for example, I hear readily avoids the problem of locating synesthetic color, whether out there or in the mind's eye, um, and instead interprets it as an interaction between the, the perceiver and the stimuli. And I think this is at least um, that this is more reflective, or at least less misleading, of uh, what synesthetic experience is like. Um, synesthetic. Colors, I don't think, are things uh, that are seen, but ways of doing blank, whether it's hearing or smelling or tasting. Um, and in cases of cognitive synesthesia, let's say involving graphing or a certain concept, this might be um, a certain way of thinking or a vivid case of the phenomenology of thought. Um, now, provided we don't immediately reject the verbal statements due to their grammatical strangeness, I think there is an appeal to, to, to this construction. Um, for, for most synesthetes, red only describes, um, uh, for, for most non-synesthetes, red, red describes seeing events. Um, for some sound color uh, synesthetes, red also describes hearing events. Um, but in either case, red is a property of an interaction um, involving a, a perceiver and stimulus, uh, and not a property that I don't think is a property necessarily to link any one sensory input. And so finally, the, uh, Cohen makes an objection to font phenomenology that the event view um, that goes against our ordinary phenomenology colors look for properties of individuals rather than events. Um, and it's unclear what kind of examples could, could convince them otherwise. And it does seem to be quite literally two ways of looking at, at, at the same thing. Um, I perceive colors within the context of perceptual events. And I don't know what the color of an individual divorce from an event would look like. Um, surface of colors, surface colors may appear as properties of individuals in a certain sense, um, but not timelessly so. And there are some uh, some examples of this. For example, the play of colors on the back of a of a CD seems to be a case in which, if not relational, uh, if not at least uh, some evidence that colors relational, uh, it could also be that that, it, that it's an event. Um, Robert uh, Robert uh, Pasnot. Um, for example, in arguing for an event view of color, um, uh, remarks that that with some practice, uh, 
uh, he has come to see colors as events as a kind of constant flame, well, roughly on the surface of objects. And in doing so, he says, the experience of seeing seems to take on a new and richer character, as if I'm only now understanding what I'm seeing. Not, not that I'm uh, advocating for that, uh, for that kind of way, way of seeing color, uh, though it does seem possible, although very much possible. Um, and I also think that for those who have an intuitive um, resistance to accept the event view of color, uh, synesthetic color phenomenology offers a counterweight here. Um, while surface color may appear stable and constant, synesthetic colors induced by sound stimuli tend to involve motion and dynamic form. For one, synesthetic music is perceived as colors moving like dots, like people in a crowd at a football game when the camera zooms in on them. For another, sounds are, are mostly likened to oscilloscope configurations, uh, lines <clears throat> moving and moving in color, often metallic with height, width, and most importantly, depth. And for yet another, the note of a vibraphone is perceived as a little gold ball falling. And I see, I see no way of expressing the phenomenology of synesthetic color without reference to events, and to simply say that each note of the vibraphone is gold seems to flatten the dynamic character of synesthetic color uh, to the stable color of, of uh, chairs and tables. Um, so in conclusion, whether we want to put synesthetic colors on the same ontological footing as normal colors uh, remains an open question. I've given this only a light treatment, um, it deserves a more extended discussion. However, uh, what I think I have shown is that if synesthetic colors are real, um, anti-realism fails to tell us how they're distinct from normal colors, and realism fails to recognize them as anything more than illusion. Um, <clears throat> so the, the kind of adverbial theory I propose at least allows us to do some of these things. Um, allows us to recognize the reality as well as distinguishing them from, from normal colors. So in the end, this paper is as much an acknowledgement of some of the limits in, in color ontology as it is a, a cautionary tale of the consequences of accepting synesthetic colors as real. So uh, this leaves us with two paths forward, I think. Uh, one is to offer more compelling arguments for why synesthetic colors are illusory, um, and in this case, why we shouldn't have to bother with them, or uh, revise our theories to accommodate synesthetic color. Uh, but in either case, it seems there's work to be done, so thank you. Hey, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I wanted to probe um, one of the sort of, sorts of considerations you've been um, exploring here generalize, or if there's something special about color, synesthetic color, so uh, to, to make 